time now for our Wednesday panel. And for the last few weeks, we've been agonizing. How much attention do we give the Taubu Besta story? What is it about the Taubu Besta saga that has captured our imagination that we even have to contemplate how we frame it? Because this is a case of a convicted rapist and murderer who now finds himself back in the spotlight. Is it because he managed to overcome an exposed and broken system which led him to being able to escape from prison via corruption is the allegation, via incompetence, and then also remaining under the radar for a year. Then there's also the aspect of influences, celebrities, maybe even political connections. There is a piece written by Eusebius Macaiser which talks about more than average looking people, pretty privileged, also playing into the concept and the conversation that we're having now. And then there's also the gender dynamic about whether um, Tabu Besta used his power to coerce and influence his co-accused Dr. Nandipa. But why is it that we're so obsessed with the story? Joining me for my Wednesday panel is Dr. David Klatso, forensic scientist, as well as, as, well as uh, one of my favorite columnists in Dumiso Ngobo um, for the Sunday Times, also the author of three best-selling books. David Ndumiso, thanks so much for joining us. Really, really appreciate it. Ndumiso, let me start with the cultural, societal impact of the uh, Tabu Besta story. I was first, yes. This is another Netflix documentary. We're going to make this into a movie. But then I became more and more frustrated because then I realized this is not a Netflix documentary. This is a story of chickens coming home to roost for a failing system, corruption, and collusion between private and public government players. I don't want this to be a Netflix documentary. I want this to be <laughs> a, a, a measure in which um, corrupt officials fall. Why has this story influenced you so much? You know, this story is, 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 is you know, this is such a cliche, but it's like it's an onion. There's just so many layers to it. And as a result, it, it, I mean, even today, this morning, I just said to myself, oh, I'm actually agreed to do this, um, this panel discussion. Uh, let me just quickly catch up what, what, what happened, because every single day, depending on whether you're looking in the afternoon or the morning, there's new layers to it. But I think that what this story is about, and I think that you wish that this becomes some kind of case study, you will win a little bit, because I imagine someone's going to write a PhD thesis about it that's going to be stuck somewhere in the back of some um, uh, dusty uh, library at some university somewhere, but the story itself, as, as, as it is, is so salacious because it speaks to everything that we really are about. Okay, so it speaks number one, and I'd like to go for this first, our selective morality. Because if you look at what people are doing and, and they're looking at the story, it's why we're so fascinated with Robin Hood, we're fascinated with Bonnie and Clyde, we're fascinated with um, mm -hmm. everyone. That's why we're fascinated by guerrilla um, you know, people who are freedom fighters, revolutionaries and so on and so forth, because the story is about things that a lot of people, this is why we read fiction. And if I had written fiction and I had given this manuscript to a, um, to a publisher, mm. they would have said to me, nah, man, Far you fish. see, there's a problem with your plot. Where is standard, where is standard five is actually <laughs> convincing this MBCHB graduate this doctor to do these things or the other one because we still do not know what the facts are. And so this story, we are exactly enthralled by it because it is exactly, uh, it is precisely enthralling. Uh, David Klatso, really appreciate your time here. You've dealt with many forensic investigations. You looked at it from a criminal investigative side. It all started off with a allegation that Tabu Besta had died in a prison fire. Then it came to light that that may not be the case, that he was actually living in Santon, shopping 
at Woolworths. And in fact, that is a body that just this week has now been identified. In terms of your history and your investigation and your work, have you come across a story as, as Ndumizo says, as layered like an onion, like this story? There are a couple of things that one needs to say, that there are multi-layers to this story, and the entire sordid event would have failed had any one of those layers been identified as fake, fake or false. So what we have here is a fundamental textbook case of industrial scale corruption. This, this is what it is. So let's have a look. The first thing that you have is you've got a body in a cell. That body in a cell died by unnatural causes. Presumably it was burnt and, and that is an unnatural cause. Or you, if, even if he died and set himself alight after he died, which I think is less likely, uh, I think that it demands a full-scale forensic medical legal post-mortem, which is a full post-mortem. During that post-mortem, various things are done. Number one, the, the nature of the body, the size, uh, any identifying marks uh, would be identified. And even, even if the body is, has been alleged as in the fetal position, it is possible to get a very reasonable, accurate, uh, reasonably accurate um, uh, estimation of the size and the height. The second thing is that invariably during a forensic medical legal postmortem, you open the skull. And to a first-year student who'd never done a post-mortem before, it would have been immediately apparent that there was serious skull injury and brain damage. The third thing that's important is you invariably open the chest and you look at the lungs and you cut a, you take a section of the lungs and you would see that that person didn't breathe in smoke. So that suggests immediately that there was another cause of death other than the fire and that the uh, body was dead when it was set alight. Now, that immediately should have set bells ringing. The second thing is that, I suppose, naively, we expect that our prisons are secure. Um, unfortunately, this is an example where that is patently not so. Um, in, in this particular instance, they had to break every rule in the book to get this plan to work. They had to get a body into the prison or murder it there both of which would have would have caused troubles uh, had it been the prison been properly policed, had proper roll calls been taken, had all the other things that required for security in a prison been done. The question as to why he was moved to a cell that was not in vision of video cameras needs to be asked who did that, who made the decision to move him, and who moved him. How did they get the body into the cell? It didn't walk in on its own, I don't think. Yeah. So one needs to find out who it was who carried it into the cell. And the next thing, of course, is how did he get out of the cell? And how did he get all the way to Tanzania uh, without being discovered somewhere along the route? And why did the police not spring into action significantly earlier? There's evidence that the police took time to get even... Past first base. So failures on checks on every single level. There's a suggestion you're into me. So that case study could be called for an academic paper. Happy birthday, Tom. From a cell in New York to Tanzania, a case study on government failure and corporate greed to the influencer economy. It includes all of that and more. Even a trip to war was in Santon. What interests me um, as a social commentator, someone who writes, as someone who uh, who likes to just look at society and kind of um, uh, turn a, a mirror towards society because that's, that's what part of my job is, is that this also says so much more. I mean, this case, um, we're talking about multi-layers and that's the theme really of the story is, is about, it's, it's, it's a psychological thriller. It, it talks about how we think, how we, how we look at, at people. Um, because if you take it to, to, I don't know, about 30 years ago in the United States and why people were cheering O.J. Simpson as he drove in that white Bronco uh, on, on that highway in, in Los Angeles is exactly the same thing that you actually see here. We're fascinated by it. I mean, it speaks to all, all, also the Senzo Meiwa case mm. where we also look at people and how we see them and how we 
how we how we reflect upon them. It's it's so interesting that in your intro you talked about that piece now by Eusebius Marcaza, which I read, and he was talking about pretty privilege, and about why it is that this story is so gasp worthy. Is is it 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 talks to us. It talks about our education system. It talks about why. We, we, you know, details are emerging. I mean, this guy started school at the age of 11. Well, how did that happen? Mm. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, the health system, it talks about um, home affairs and, and how someone could not have uh, an identity document, allegedly. I mean, there's always an allegedly in all of this because, you know, the Kate calls, uh, Kate court, uh, court, uh, court uh, not being heard. And so what we're talking about here is it really, I, I alluded to it as well, but also our, moral uh, or se- selective morality because what are we seeing in this case but, if you actually give it some some serious thought lester you, is, the oj simpson how many times does this happen yeah look the oj simpson comparison yeah. is important because the oj simpson case divided america between yeah. black and white and i think this yeah this story yeah. not divides south mm. africa but it puts us in our little silos where you have a largely middle class mm. South Africa says, of course, it's government corruption and ineptitude. That is the focus on a young, particularly black South Africa. It's about the, the characters. It's about the young people involved. It's about the TikTok and social media influences who involved in the salacious, scandalous information that is coming out. It is similar. I agree with you to an O.J. Simpson case in how it's compartmentalizing different parts of, of mm. this country, but I think for very different reasons. Forces us to think about things that we've, we're generally too lazy to think about. I mean, we, we just had the same uh, capital mission into the nitty gritty, that detail. And you actually listen and you read the stories about and you read that report. There are so many stories they are very similar yeah. to this particular story. It's just that people are very different from your normal um, characters and protagonists mm-hmm. in these stories. Uh, David Klatzer, we, we talk about from the... Um, I want to move from the pathological uh, in, investigation into the autopsy and, and, and simply in the, the broader forensic investigation of how he could have escaped. How also the story of Tabu Besta he is a convicted rapist and murderer. But also coming to light that he that he's lived under the radar in South Africa without a, an ID book, without even questions about his own mm. I, I, identity. What does that tell you about this particular character, but also of the state of the state? I think what you've got to get away from is to try and make any kind of racial divide about this. Mm-hmm. Everybody in this country has a right to know that the police are protecting them from serial rapists and killers. And that once those rapists and killers are locked up, that they're not let out because of their position, status, or whatever failings the state may have indulged in prior to this. And whether 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 it's an interesting story or not, it affects every single South African, including Demisa, that they should be locked up, and once they've been, once the law has been allowed to take its course, they should be rehabilitated if possible, and let free. But not in this way that that, that we see here. And it it bespeaks to a complete breakdown on all levels: Department of Home Affairs, the police, the people who looked after our borders and are supposed to see that convicted criminals don't pop across the border to go and shop at Woolies in another country, for that matter. Um, the the whole story is just too disgraceful for words. Yeah. And I'm frightened to say that it bespeaks a general breakdown in law and order. And that breaks my heart to see it happen in South Africa the way it is. I'd hoped once the apartheid police were largely out the way, I'd hoped that we would have a, a new dawning here. Mm. But But I've been deeply, deeply disappointed. We've moved from the... From the intrigue, the mystery of his escape and his recapture, now we go into a trial phase, which I think is just going to bring even more. It's going to be a trial by TV. It's un- it's undeniable. There may even be documentaries. We saw the Senzo Miyiwa case resulting in a documentary while the court was still in session. But added to this is going to be the dynamics of 
of gender and power and how people are framed. There's even cases of xenophobia at the moment, to be so people profiling him and saying, but he doesn't look South African. There's so many issues that are actually just sort of small little slices of the broader story of South Africa, of an imbalanced economy, of greed, of um, celebrity culture, to even issues of xenophobia, issues of political connectivity, and issues of state and private corruption. This is the story that continues to give him to me. So, Lester, when you look at this, at this, at, at, at this story, one of the features of how it is South Africans interact with what is in is in the news, current affairs, is purely because the nature of this country, and we. We, we sometimes we don't acknowledge this, uh, acknowledge it enough. Is that this is a very young country, finding its its identity and moving forward and so on. And so what happens because we are uh, trapped in that particular uh, space is we have a lot happening. Our news cycle is crazy. So many things happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. And usually these stories we get fixated on them. Yeah. We move right along. There is absolutely no post-mortem. There is absolutely no debrief afterwards it's to, say, to say, but what did this mean for us? Mm -hmm. And so this is just a prism. And I, and I insist, this is just a bounce back. This is like, it's Newton's um, is a third law where it says for every action, there's a reaction. This, this mm -hmm. story could only have happened here in South Africa in the way that it has. Mm -hmm. This is a reflection. This is, this is, think of this story as a prism through which we need to, mm -hmm. to be looking at ourselves and say, geez, but then who, who are we? Because you're absolutely right. The fact that allegedly this man's father might have been an illegal immigrant from the subcontinent is a huge big part of what it is that we're so intrigued mm -hmm. by it. And let's not pretend that it's not, because it's, it is. And so, David, I'm looking forward to chatting to you maybe in the next few weeks as you continue your stay uh, uh, visit here in Cape Town. Dumiso, really appreciate your time. David Katso, forensic uh, uh, scientist and Dumiso and global columnist for the Sunday Times, is author of the book, uh, several books which I appreciate. Some of my best friends are white. It's Is It Cause I'm Black? and Eat, Drink and Blame the Ancestors. You can still probably find that at one or two good bookstores, or you can wait for the Sunday Times and read him then. David Ndumiso, really appreciate your time.